All righty. Well, good morning, BNC. I know you guys couldn't see this, uh, but I could because I'm up here. Um, I just uh, like turned on the mic, and that's usually the cue for like the music to come down and like the, the slide to go up. And I turned my mic on. I was like, I need a drink of water. And so the tech team, uh, they're doing great back there. I'm just playing tricks on them. So sorry, tech team, but thank you for your service. Um, yeah, if we haven't met, my name is Ben. I serve here as the youth pastor. And right now, we're in a series on uh, called Sabbath. And we're looking at what it means to rest through worship. And so today, we're going to continue in that. And, and we're going to finish that up next week. It's, it's really been such a good series. Uh, I know for even my own soul. And so uh, keep coming back. We would love uh, to see you guys next week again. Uh, but before I get started with my message, I did want to share um, a praise report with you and just say thank you. Um, first off, thank you to everyone uh, who gave and prayed over our summer camp. Uh, we got back a week ago Friday, so it's like we've been back for about uh, 10 days now. And man, it was such an exhausting camp, but that means that it was good. Right? Like, if you've ever been to camp, if you've ever led at camp, uh, talk to me about next year. I'm already looking for leaders. Um, but I wanted to say thank you guys for your generosity because that allowed, um, I want to say, eight of our students to be able to go to camp that would not otherwise be able to go to camp. And so thank you guys for that. Um, what a blessing uh, that is. And in addition to that, and this is like where it's like, man, it makes me emotional thinking about um, it. We had six students surrender their lives to the Lord at camp. And so uh, we are praising the Lord for that uh, this morning. In addition to that, uh, we, had, we had seven students that decided to, um, that decided to uh, confess some very deep uh, sin struggles. And so we got to come up alongside them and pray for them and encourage them. And so I'm going to ask one more thing of you guys coming down the hill from camp. Would you guys be continuing to pray for our students? Don't forget about them. Um, we... At the end of the week, I said, hey, guys, what was your favorite part of the week? Um, and then what was, what's something that you would like to like, take down the hill with you? And, and one of the things that uh, the students shared is like, we really just want to be in community together more. And we want to like, practically share the love of Jesus with people around us. And like, what a praise for that. Like, I could drop the mic right now. I'm not going to because it's very expensive. But I could drop it, and, like, we could, like, walk out of here right now because that is such an amazing uh, blessing that God has done in and through these students. And also, um, we had some students share that they just want to, like, worship and not care what other people think about them. And I just thought, man... What a cool thing. And so if you see a student um, that you see is serving at our church, if you see them just walking around, give them a word of encouragement. If you see them worshiping, um, like, man, give them some encouragement. Your words go a long ways. I told the first service, I was like, they might look at you funny, but they look at me funny, and I'm their youth pastor, so you guys should be okay. Uh, don't take it personal. Um, but with that said... Um, we're going to transition back into our series, and we are looking at this idea of Sabbath and rest to worship. And, and Pastor Rocky and Jessica have done a great job of, of kicking this series off for us and really talking about some of the practical uh, ways to, um, to, to actually Sabbath. And, and so today, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what it means to abide to abide in Jesus. And so our passage this morning comes from first, or sorry, it comes from John 15, and we're gonna start in verse one. It says this, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit 
but apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you will bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love, and if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the, the people that are here gathered. We thank you for the people online. Lord, once again, we just ask that our hearts and our ears would be open to whatever you have for us here this morning, that we would come to have a better understanding of who you are and have a desire to to pursue you and spend more time resting in your presence. God, we love you and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So today, we're really focusing on this main idea about how we must abide in Jesus, this is your first fill in the blank, is we must abide in Jesus. And maybe if you're like me, uh, you were thinking about the word abide, and you're like, okay, I've heard like the phrase, like, we must abide by someone's rules. And okay, cool, but I want to like help you guys understand like also what it means in Scripture. And so in Scripture, this word abide uh, means to dwell. It means to remain. It means to be held or kept in something. And so when I talk about abide this morning, that's what I'm talking about, how we must dwell, how we must be kept, how we must rest and be held in his presence. You see, when I was a kid, um, I think about the times where it's like I struggled to rest, Um, like I was a horrible sleeper as a kid. Any parents have kids like that? Okay, yeah, we got a couple. Okay, you know the pain. All right, I was that kid. My bad, mom and dad. Um, But... I uh, was terrified of sleeping in my room. Little context. We lived in a two-story house. Um, My room was upstairs. My parents' room was downstairs. And I was absolutely terrified of sleeping in my room um, because I was afraid I was going to get kidnapped. Um, I blamed my mom for watching Special Victims Unit in front of me. That is why uh, I think I had that fear. Uh, Looking back, I'm like, no one was going to kidnap a 120-pound fourth grader. Like, they're not climbing up two flights of stairs or or going through a window. But that was like my biggest fear. And so every night before bed, it was a fight. And you guys get a little bit of a different story because like there's kind of a thing between my parents or my my dad would be like, if you fall asleep on the couch before your mom gets home, you can sleep downstairs. I'd be like, deal. And so I'd close my eyes and I'd lay super still. Joke's on me because I fell asleep. Um. But then my mom would be like, if you fall asleep before your dad gets home, you can sleep on the couch. And it was great, right? Like, I, I figured out the system. But there was this night where I was, uh, where we had a babysitter, and my parents were out on a nice date, and the um, babysitter was like, it's time for bed. And I was like, no. Like, <laughs> this is not, it is not time for bed. I'm young. I don't remember how old I was. I want to say I was like kindergarten, maybe. But I was, I was young, and I did not want to go to bed. So she's begging with me. She's pleading with me. My sister's probably over it. She's older. So she comes into my room, and she's like, hey, um, I'll sleep on the ground next to you. Like, let's change things up. What an adventure. We'll sleep on the ground. And so we grab our blankets. We're laying on the ground. And and I, uh, in a panic, sit up. Well, I had a metal uh, headboard or footboard on my bed. And so I came up fast, and I... uh, Got a nice little slice on my forehead. 
Um, I'm crying. My babysitter's crying because she can't handle blood. It's just, like, it's a whole, like, it's, it's, it's a rough night. My parents have to come home from their date. Uh, they're very gracious. I'm sur- sure that they're very frustrated with me. Uh, but as I reflected back on that story, And as I reflected on my lack of desire to rest and to allow myself to rest to the place of falling asleep, I realized that my rest was directly correlated to my, like, physical proximity to my dad. Because, like, growing up, like, the ultimate, like, dig on another kid on the playground was like, my dad will beat up your dad, right? Like... And that's how I felt about my dad. My dad's one of the most kind-hearted people. Like, I don't think I've ever seen him, like, aggressive. Like, he's raised his voice once, and, like, I'm his kid. That's impressive. Like, he um, was uh, just such a kind-hearted person. But I realized that my safety, my security, rested in my physical proximity to him. And so, obviously, being far away, being upstairs, way away from him, I felt as though I was in some sort of danger, and I, my anxiety would take over, and I would not be able to fully rest. But I think in the same way, our proximity to our Heavenly Father really affects our relationship with Him and our ability to rest. And so as we go through this, this series on rest, I know it's not comfortable for people to talk about because like most of us are like, man, I can't wait to go to bed or I can't wait for my Sunday nap. That's a good thing to do. But like to rest in the Lord's presence is also important. You see, if we're honest with ourselves, we, we always, all of us rest in something or someone, It might be our spouse, it might be our kids, it might be our work, our houses, our vacations, our car, how much money is in our bank account, what people think of us, our status in society, and the list could go on and on and on. See, I'm personally terrible at rest. Between being a husband, a father, a youth pastor, a friend, and a business owner, like there's many moments where I need my community of believers to come around me and check in on me. And I have some amazing men that do that. Man, Ben, what are you reading in scripture? And like, I can be honest with them. I can process through those things that like when I'm not doing a good job of resting in the Lord. You see, I think that many of us are terrible at rest because in our, the culture that we live in, and I can't remember if someone else shared this, but I'm going to share it anyways. Um, we celebrate busyness. And what I mean by that is, like, there's, there's so many times. I literally did it to someone this morning myself. Uh, Pastor Ben, how you doing? I was like, I'm busy. Right? And, like, I, but as a culture, we, we, we look at busyness and we're like, wow, that's amazing. That person's hustling. That person's grinding. Right? That person's doing, like, they're working extra hard for their family. Like, and those things are good, but not at the expense of our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Right? I want to make that very clear. But like, we're so big on celebrating busyness that sometimes I think that we forget to take a step back and to rest in his presence. See, my hope is that as we leave here today, we have a better understanding of what it means to remain in him, to abide in him and to dwell with him. You see, our first point this morning is that we must abide in his presence. We must dwell, we must remain, we must be kept in his presence in our daily lives. Now, I know like Rocky and Jessica, they talked about like having like a set time during the week, like that's amazing, like, but I also want to talk about abiding in him in our daily lives, like that is a call on believers. And it goes on, or it says in uh, John 15 verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, there's a little side note, and I'm going to get your pens ready, uh, because 
I messed up in my paperwork that I sent to Ed, who like creates all the slides for us, and so I messed up. So I'm going to give you something to write down as one of my points, uh, but you're going to have to write it all in yourself, okay? So his presence is sufficient. His presence is sufficient. I think there's many times where it's like we look at life and we're like, man, I want to go do all the things all the time. I want to like, like, there's all these different things that go through our mind. But like we have to come to a place where we understand like his presence is sufficient for our lives. Like anybody have fear of missing out? No, just me? Okay, cool. Um, that's me. Like, that's why I think I struggle with resting so much, because, like, um, I told uh, first service, uh, I take, like, three to four naps a year. Uh, one of them is always the day we get back from camp, and today might be number two. We'll see. Um, I don't know. Um, but I think sometimes we're so fearful of missing out on something that we forget to spend time in his presence, and his presence is sufficient. But I love the visual we have here because this visual of the vine and the branch and, and the gardener, and, and it points to a correct judgment by our God, but to the beauty of life when following him. See, Jesus is the true vine. He is the giver of life. And through his spirit, we are being pruned and shaped into who he has created us to be, to glorify him and rest, to abide, to dwell in his presence. But how do we be in his presence? How do, we, how do we go about practically being in his presence? See, being in his presence is going to require sacrifice. Being in his presence is going to require some sort of sacrifice. See, maybe it's getting up a little bit earlier. Maybe it's putting your, your phone down more. Maybe it's saying no to going out with, with friends. And may, maybe it's, it's going to bed like... Whatever that is for you, like, naturally, if you're a busy person and you're not spending time with the Lord, like, it's going to take a sacrifice somewhere. Maybe it's not watching one of your favorite shows. Like, I promise you, being in his presence is worth it. Like, it is so incredibly worth it. But in addition to sacrifice of our time, it's going to require a sacrifice of our hearts. And I want to be very clear in this, like not saying like, you know, do some surgery on yourself. Like what I am saying is that it, like there might be something in your life right now. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe, um, maybe it's a, a unforgiveness of someone, anxiety about things that the Lord has told you not to worry about. Maybe it's, it, there, there could be a world of different things. And maybe right now the Lord's saying, hey, I want, you to, I, want, I want you to allow me to prune that out of your life. I want to, like, I want to free up some of your, your anxiety. I want to free up some of your, your pain, your suffering, your, your struggles. Your, 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 like, I want to free some of that up so you can move on in the life that loves and serves the Lord. You see, when we talk about sacrifice, when we talk about these things, like, man, you, you might have to give up your phone. Like, that's not always, like, the easiest thing to do. And honestly, if you were to talk to me a year ago, I'd have been like, you're silly. I don't have to give up my phone. I don't spend that much time on my phone. And then Apple decided to put on a thing, like, on Sunday mornings. It's like, hey, your phone time has been blah, blah, blah per day. Right? Anyone else get that? Like, it's the worst part of my week uh, because it brings reality to how much time I've spent on my phone. And so December, I was like, I'm spending way too much on these rabbit holes of political posts and theology debates. And I was just like, I, I just don't need this in my life anymore. And so I deleted it off my phone. And I would check once a week just to see if friends message me or students or families or whatever it was. But I really did take a long time away from regular use of social media. And it was hard at first because you like flip to that right same spot every time. Um, but it was so good for my heart. It was so good for my soul. And so for maybe for you, that's a simple one. And I know that's scary. I know that it's nerve wracking. But like the world will continue to rotate around the sun. And we will continue to like survive. So um, maybe that's something for you. 
You see, because I can, I, can be, I can be truthful with this. Whatever it is, I promise, whatever the Lord is pruning out of your life, his pruning is always best. See, I remember watching my grandma uh, prune branches in her garden. I <clears throat> am not a gardener. Uh, I would kill a plant at Hobby Lobby. That's fake, right? Like, that's, that's how I am. Like, it just, it would not be good for me. But my grandma, she was a great gardener. She had the most beautiful rose bushes. Again, if you're a gardener, give me some grace for the next two minutes, because uh, I am not. Um, and I, yeah, just, if I use an incorrect term, come talk to me after. Don't heckle me from the crowd. But my grandma, I was following her around one day, and she, she has her uh, things that she's, she's pruning uh, the, the bushes. And I was like, wow, like, Grandma, are you sure that you should have, like, cut that one? Like, that looked all right. And, and she would go, and she, she was so fast and so precise. And, and it was really actually, like, as I reflect back on my memories with my grandma, like, it was really cool to watch her in a level of her expertise. You see... She didn't look at me when I was four and be like, hey, Ben, here's some shears. Go have some fun. That would be unwise. Do not do that. But what she did do is she showed me, she demonstrated to me the, the correct way of doing these things. Now, I didn't get a green finger, as I told you, but she knew best. And she had the most beautiful roses in her garden. Like, I remember them to this day. And that was like, they sold that house when I was like seven years old. I still remember following her in that. See, she knew best what was best for her plants. And in the same way, when we allow the Lord to do some pruning in our lives and when we abide in him, it allows the fruit of the Holy Spirit to, even, to be even more present in our lives. Now, <clears throat> Maybe you're wondering, what is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Now, the first church that I ever worked at, they had this song that they played every day for kids' uh, worship, and it's stuck in my head forever. So I'm going to get it stuck in your head. You're welcome. But it comes from a passage in Galatians chapter 5. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, to woohoo, gentleness, and self-control. I've got spirit. How about you? That's what, it, that's what it does. I guess. And it helps me remember the fruit of the Spirit. Like, you're welcome. You could probably look it up on YouTube if you would like more information. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or in other words, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And if there's ever a th list of things that I could uh, want more of, it would be this list right here. I've never woken up on a day and I'd be like, man, I wish I was more angry. Wow, you gave me way too much patience for my kids today. Like, those, those things just don't come out of our mouths. Like, we're like, Lord, I need patience for these middle schoolers right now. Like, love them, but like, I need some patience. Lord, I need some more kindness for, 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 my, for my friend or for my neighbor or the person that cut me off. You see, his pruning is always best because his, his pruning produces more fruit of the Spirit in our lives. You see, we must abide in his presence. We must dwell. We must remain in his presence. And we do this because he is the source of life. Now, I love to travel. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to uh, travel around, and I've been very blessed to do that. And as you get on a plane, if you've ever ridden on one, uh, like you, you, they, they, everyone's loaded up, they close the door, and they began to taxi out to the runway. Well, when they're doing that, the, the flight attendants, they get into the middle of the aisle, and uh, they're kind of spread throughout the plane, and, and they, began to, they begin to do a safety uh, brief, right? So I don't know if that's the correct term for it, but that's what they do. And they tell you, like, hey, uh, here's, a, uh, here's where the life jackets are. Um, yeah, you, they point with, because apparently you can't point with one finger. I saw one guy back there. They have to do two. I don't understand that. Uh, but uh, 
they go through this whole thing, and, and they're like, if, you know, we crash land or water land, like there's slides that pop out. Um, but then they get to the end, and they're like, hey, if our cabin loses pressure, these masts will drop from above you, and then you pull it towards you, and you put it on your face, right? Oxygen will begin to flow. They tell you to breathe normal. Like, you're going to be just fine, now, that's super helpful, right? Like, if we were to ever be in, like, a scenario like that, I know some people that have had that happen to them, and, like, that is scary. But thankfully, because it was there, they were able, like, they were just fine. Like, they, because if you're that high up, like, the oxygen is so, th- I don't even know if there's oxygen. Like, it's, it's not going to be good for your health. And I've never once, like, sat through one of those safety briefs and, and just said, this lady can't tell me what to do. Who does she think she is? Like, maybe I don't want to wear a mask, lady, right? That would be silly because she's trying to help me understand this thing that is going to be a source of life for me until we can get onto the ground. You guys see what I'm talking about here? Jesus is the source of life. We need to be connected to him. We need to rest. We need to abide. We need to be with him. Verse 5 goes on and says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burn. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. I absolutely love how it repeats the fact that that he is the vine. He is the giver of life. He is our source of life. He keeps our world spinning around the sun at insane speeds. Like, if you look at the science between, like, about where the earth is, and it's like, I think it's like if we're like a few centimeters, like, closer to the sun, like, we would all be incinerated. Like, that's crazy. Like, but he holds it all together. He gives us the breath in our lungs. He knows the very hairs on our heads. And I want to serve a God. I want to be present and be in the life of someone that created me. See, he is the vine and we are the branches. We receive our nutrients from him. And in Jesus' time, repeating things like this over and over again, we're done to communicate a super important thing. And so I think that this morning, we should understand that he is the vine and we are the branches. It's not the other way around. It actually talks about, like, if there's, if there's a branch that's cut off, like, it's not going to produce fruit anymore. But like, what a beautiful thing that we serve a God that we can be connected to, that we can worship, that we can spend time in his presence. Like, I think about that often, like, what a blessing it is that we have that opportunity here in 2024. Because, like, if you read the Old Testament, it's like these priests, they had, like, there's once a year where one of them got to go into the Holy of Holies. Like, to be in the very presence of God, and we have direct access to our God because of what Jesus did on the cross. What a gift that is. You see, this passage communicates that remaining in him is necessary. Now, my points are not like all that like, wow, mind blown. But like, I think we need reminders of it. You see, remaining in him is necessary. Without Jesus, there is nothing. There might be some things that feel right in the moment or feel good for a second, but life apart from Christ is empty and void. And I know that because scripture tells us. And I know that from personal experience before I came to know the Lord, and I I was like, I grew up in the church, but I was like, man, I don't want want any part of that. Like, I'll show up to to church and sing the songs because I kind of like the tunes. Like, I like music, but, but like, I had no relationship with the Lord. And it led me down to this path of trying to fill that thing with with relationships and with different addictions and, and different struggles that left me in a lot of pain and the people around me in a lot of pain. Remaining in Him is necessary. 
And I shared this with the first service, and I think that I need to share it here again. Um, As Christians, when we share our testimony, that's such a powerful moment that we have with a believer or a non-believer. But I heard a pastor once say, we need to be cautious not to make, not to glorify our life before Christ over our life in Christ. Um, Because growing up as a kid and attending youth group and not having a relationship with the Lord, like I remember the guy with all the tattoos and, you know, the cool clothes and and he's like walking in and he's like, I went to prison. And I was like, whoa, that's a cool testimony how you've been saved. And like you have this like thought in your mind, like, wow, I need to do some crazy stuff if I'm going to find Jesus. Like that's not what the scriptures say. Like don't do that. But I think I'm guilty of this myself. So as much as I'm sharing it with you, I'm preaching it to myself. Because my life since knowing our Lord and Savior and understanding his saving grace has been far better, far more peaceful. Like, I go to bed and I'm not like, man, who did I absolutely, like, crush today? I go, like, I can, I can rest in the fact that, like, I'm a sinner and need a saving, that the Lord is continuing to do a redeeming work in my life. And so... Let us be cautious of that as believers. Remaining in him is necessary. There's never been a time or a moment in worship or prayer, sharing my faith or reading and listening to scripture that I've thought to myself, wow, this is terrible. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, Because every time that I do it, I'm like, I should do this more often. I should do this more frequently. I should maybe set some alarms uh, on my phone to remind me. It's actually something that I did to get into the habit of praying uh, because how my mind works is I have a million things going on uh, all the time, whether I'm sitting on the couch or actually doing something. And I had to set alarms on my phone at 9, 12, and 3 every day just to remember to pray. And so maybe for you, that's something that you need to do to spend more time in his presence. Like, and it's not necessarily a long time every time. Like, there's times where it's like, Lord, thank you for that reminder. Like, I'm going to pray. But I've never once thought to myself, man, that was awful. I shouldn't do that again. Maybe for you, you need some simple tips on how to spend more time in his presence on a daily basis. One of my favorite things uh, that you can do is on the YouVersion Bible app, um, if you're struggling to spend time in his word, uh, they actually have an option where you can press play, and it will read it for you. Uh, That guy sounds kind of interesting to me and kind of creeps me out. Um, So, but that one's free. I use one. It's called Dwell. You pay for it, but it's pretty awesome. They have a British guy. And he has, like, some music uh, underneath him. It's awesome. You can choose piano, guitar. Like, it's cool. Go, uh, maybe that's an option for you to spend more time in God's word. Like, it doesn't have to be, like, man, I got to go spend three hours in God's word right now. Like, that's good. I don't think you're going to regret it. But it's, like, entry-level points to spending time in his presence is so important. And I want you guys to grasp that here this morning. See, remaining in Jesus is the best thing that we can do each and every day. Because whatever comes our way, good or bad, tough or celebratory, he, he gives us his peace, his joy, and so many of his other gifts that we just talked about a little bit ago. And by understanding that he is the source of life, we understand that we cannot do anything apart from him. Right? If there's a source of life, like, Obviously, like, if we're cut off from that thing, we can't do anything apart from that. But in verse 7, it talks about remaining in him, and if we do, he will give us whatever we ask. Now, this verse is not, uh, we need to pause and, like, talk about this verse real quick, uh, because what this verse is not saying is, um, if you want a million dollars, you can pray that, and God's going to give it to you, okay? Okay. Prayed that when I was 11, did not work, okay? So we got to be aware of that. Uh, However, what it does mean is that when we do surrender our lives to the Lord and we spend more time in his presence, when we abide in him in our daily lives, our desires begin to change. And we begin to ask for the things that the Lord wants. And he begins to move in mighty ways through those things. So this is not a get rich 
uh, quick thing. This is a come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. And I will begin to change your heart, and I will then send you out to be my disciple to the community around you, to be a missional neighbor, missional neighbor, impacting your neighborhoods for Jesus Christ. See, his word, if his word remains in us, then we will begin to ask the things that he desires, like life surrender to him and strength to share the gospel when it's hard. First John 5. 13 through 15 says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Notice how it says, according to his will. Not our will, not our desires, his. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that he that we have what we have asked of him. See, our final point this morning is that our life should, all, should bring glory back to him always. As we look at what it means to abide in him, the, the abiding in him produces a fruit of something, and that, our li- and that fruit should be that our, that our lives bring glory back to him always. Because this statement is true and certainly requires our surrender to the Lord. We need his strength to help us keep his commands on a daily basis. Oh, I forgot to flip to that one. Sorry, earlier, guys. Um, It goes on in verse 9. Oh, man, I did forget a point. Okay, hold up. I need to, I need, I do need to touch on this. Go back, go back. Okay. Because he is a source of life, our life should bring glory back to him always. Okay, that, that is, that is, uh, that is a true statement. And I share it this way with our students frequently. When, it, say I'm standing on the street, okay? This is a hypothetical situation. I'm not standing on random streets, okay? Just, but I was, say I'm standing on a street, I have my AirPods in, jamming out to some music, and a bus is coming right for me, and someone pushes me out of the way. I'm not going to look at that person and be like, ow, that hurt my back. Like, why would you do that? Like, I was chilling, like, just jamming out to some music. Like, why would you touch me? No, I would probably spend the majority of my life, like, uh, like dug in up, like, hello, master, like, can I serve you? If you've watched Up, the movie, there's a dog, he's, yeah, you'll understand that reference. If you don't, I'm sorry, go watch the movie. But I would probably be spending my life figuring out a way to honor and serve this person because they did a her- heroic act to, to save my life. So if we're willing to do that for someone here on this earth, we should certainly be willing to do that for the God who already did. Jesus died on the cross 2,000 some years ago to pay the penalty that you and I deserved for our sin. That through our faith in him, we can be forgiven and set free to live a life of abundance. In his presence, And we receive these gifts of like, man, we get to rest in God? Like, what a cool thing. Like, there's so many other religions out there that it's like they can't even approach their God. But we have a God who wants to be in relationship and to be with us. Finally, this passage reminds us that we abide in him by keeping his commands. That statement is true and certainly requires surrender to the Lord. And we need his strength to help us follow his commands on a daily basis. We abide in him by keeping his commands. It goes on, it says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you that this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. 
Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have also made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. You know, there's, there's many times where it's like I talk to people outside of uh, the Christian faith, and and I talked to him about, like, you know, what turns you off about the Christian faith? And, like, you know, why or why did you leave the church? And, and there's a bunch of different answers. And, and, but, but there's a lot of people that talk about, like, I just I don't feel like Scripture is beneficial to me. And I don't think that um, I want to follow all of those commands. Like, sadly, there's so many people that are roaming this earth that feel as though God's word is just this book of rules. And, hey, don't do this. And I'll tell you why that makes me sad. It makes me sad because it means that like I'm not doing my job as, as a Christian to, to make sure that I'm communicating that the book is so much more than just that. The book is the, the greatest redemption story that you could ever read. If you've never read scripture from beginning to end, it is the most magnificent story with some of the craziest things that have ever actually happened crazy. But so many people are walking around feeling like, man, this is just a book of rules. And so thankfully at camp, there's a, the, the speaker there, he shared this example of, of how he talks to people about that very uh, concern. Like, hey, the book of the Bible is just a bunch of rules. And so he shares it this way. Him and his buddy were going on a uh, mission trip in a, a war-torn country about 20 years after a civil war broke out. And they were there to uh, minister to an orphanage and, and help just whatever ministry needs they needed. And so he, him and his buddy, they show up. They, they get a hotel their first night after flying in. And, and they're, they're standing, getting their room. And his buddy says to the receptionist, like, hey, uh, are we allowed to play soccer on that field right there? And the receptionist said, sure. She's like, however, you should probably know something. And what she goes on to share is that because of the Civil War, uh, at one point, uh, someone buried a bunch of mines under the grass of said soccer field. And uh, she's like, obviously, you're welcome to go play, but like, play at your own risk, right? Like, that'd be an adventurous soccer game, right? But here's where we're going to get hypothetical, right? That was a loving thing for her to do, right? Like, we can all agree. Like, that was a very caring thing for her to do. But now imagine someone comes out, like, say, they're like, man, we really want to play soccer, and this is the only field that they could ever do it on, right? Hypothetical. But say a guy comes out, and, and he has a scanner, and, and he puts a massive cone around each mine. Say he does that. Would you ever, like, look at that guy or the receptionist and being like, I was kind of looking for an adventure on this trip. Like, you're kind of ruining that right now. No, we would say, wow, thank you so much for putting that boundary there, for protecting me in that moment. And in the same way, the commands of Scripture are not these rules that we must uh, follow, and they're, they're robbing us of fun. They are a guide. They are a help. They are a preventing us from hurting ourselves. You see, our obedience in following his commands is a reflection of our love for him. This does not mean that we are saved because of how we act, because Ephesians 2 uh, tells us otherwise. And this is certainly not, uh, does not affect God's love towards us. This is a, re our obedience is a reflection of our love for him. I recently started training for a, um, for a half marathon, and I know I'm sharing a lot of stories today, but I, I want you guys to really understand like the, the, 
the importance of spending time in his love, in his presence. And so I'm, I'm training for this half marathon, and my, I told uh, one of my young adults who used to lead and, uh, with me, and he goes, uh, can I coach you? I was like, sure. Like, he's a track coach. Like, he knows what he's talking about. And, and so he gives me a plan, and each Sunday he, I get that plan, and he says, hey, follow this plan, prioritize rest. Cool. Now I have a, I have a few different options, right? Like, one, I could go over here, and I could be like, I don't really want to run today. And do that over and over and over again. And then I get to my half marathon and I'm absolutely gassed because I can't breathe and I'm struggling to run. Or I could go to the other side and I could be like, I'm not going to listen to him. I want to get there faster, so I'm going to run more. And that's going to lead to injury and hurt and I'm not going to be able to run at all. Or because I love and respect him as a coach, I say, I'm going to follow exactly what you tell me to do. 1 John 2, 3 through 6, says, We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did which was certainly as a, with a servant heart and a sacrificial life. See, in our obedience to Christ produces joy. This is a simple truth, yet powerful one. You see, there's been many points in my life where it's like, man, I, do, I, do, I, do I really want to be obedient to where the Lord's calling me right now? And, and it's been hard in those moments where I've been obedient initially, because it hurts, because sometimes he's calling you to prune relationships out of your life. Sometimes he's calling you to move to a different church. Sometimes he's, he's doing these different things that we can't see the bigger picture, yet he's calling us to do them. It was really hard for me to leave my last church because I loved many of the students there. I had so many relationships, and like it just felt like we were getting started, and then the Lord was like, it's time to move on. You're handing this ministry off to your intern, and you're moving on. And we didn't know about that. Like, this position wasn't even open at that point. Like, this is, this is not a made-up. Like, this is my life. And I was scared, and I was nervous. And my, my church, I was like, hey, give me six weeks. And they're like, we're giving you two. And so my last day was the last day of August last year. This job listing didn't go up till September 7th. And although it's not a long time, like I understand that, like many people have to wait much longer for things like this. But to, to experience the joy of being here at a church that loves and supports our family. My wife and I, like we go home almost every Sunday and we're like, I am so thankful uh, for BNC. Because we feel so loved, we feel so supported. I like the amount of people that have come up to me and talked to me about how they're praying for our students, do you know how much that means to me as their youth pastor? Like, man, you guys are a prayerful church, and so thank you for that. Let's continue to do that. Let's continue to change lives and impact our neighborhoods for Jesus. Our obedience to Christ produces joy. And finally, by abiding in him, we desire what he desires. By resting in him, by spending time with him in his presence. And I love, absolutely love what Pastor Rocky and Jessica said over the last couple of weeks about like, you don't have to just like resting in his presence is not necessarily like, okay, I'm going like right into a full day of Sabbath. Like maybe that's not a reality for you, but like, man, take a half hour as a family one night this week. Put your phones away. Turn the TV off. Like, spend it in worship. Spend it reading God's word together. If you need a kid's Bible to read together as a family because you don't have one, I would love to recommend you. I would love to recommend one to you. If you need Bibles for your students, come find me. I would be happy to gift them one. Because my hope is that we, after we leave this series, that we would understand what it means to Sabbath, to rest in worship. That's my hope, that we would experience more of him, more of his love, more of his 
grace, more of his peace. Let's pray. God, we come before you here today, and we just thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for the gift of Sabbath, because that's, certain, that's what it is. It is a gift that you have given us to where we get to rest in your presence if we desire. And so, Lord, I pray that you would change the desires of our hearts, that we would desire to be with you more often. Lord, that you would uh, do the, the good work as the gardener to, to prune out the things that we need to prune out and to give us the strength to not bring those things back in. God, you are such an amazing God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.